Let us look to the Lord in prayer. Our Father in heaven, once again we thank thee for a good night rest that thou hast granted to us, that we are able to wake up early this morning. This breath of life cometh from thee. We are alive because of thee, thou who art the giver of life, the sustainer of life, the creator of all things, we come before thee, and we humble ourselves as thy creatures. Thou art the creator, and we ask of thee to be with us in a most special way. Throughout this camp, may thou speak to our hearts in a still small voice, minister to thy people, that we who are thy beloved children may hear thy voice through the preaching of thy word, that we may take heed, obey thee, and apply thy truth into our lives. We give thee thanks for this wonderful opportunity that we can have in this blessed camp, and we want to commit this time of worship and devotion into thy loving hands, for we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <laughs> the Bible tells us that this is a prayer of Moses. He is called the man of God. This phrase, the man of God, is not only a reference to Moses, it was also referred to people like Samson, Samuel, Elijah, Elisha, David. And they were all called the man of God. And also Timothy in the New Testament was called the man of God. This term technically speaks about someone who is a messenger of God, someone who speaks the word of God, but it can also be referred to someone who belongs to God, a child of God. If you remember, Paul said to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3 verse 16 that God's word is given by the inspiration of the Almighty God and it is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be perfect and thoroughly furnished. So God's word is for God's children, you and I, so that we can be the man of God that God wants us to be, right? So this was written by Moses, the man of God. Now the first few nine verses, he speaks about God. He focuses on God. Before the mountains were brought forth, thou art the one who formed the earth and the world. Thou art the creator from everlasting to everlasting. He is God. Now we want to focus on verse 10. I think most of you are quite familiar with this verse. Verse 10, 11, and 12. So this will be our focus for this morning's message. Moses was a man who had experienced many things. Remember he was a prince in Egypt. And then he became a fugitive. He had to run for his life because the Pharaoh wanted to take his life. And then later on, God used him to deliver the children of Israel. God appeared to him in the midst of the burning bush. He was used by God to lead the Israelites out of Egypt. We learn about the opening of the Red Sea the manna that cometh from heaven. Now all these wonderful stories we read about Moses. In his life he had experienced great victories, but also great tragedies. If you remember he sinned against God, and he was not allowed to enter into the promised land. And sadly, an entire generation of the Israelites perished in the wilderness. Only Joshua and Caleb 
were allowed to enter the promised land. So all of us can imagine, every day there will be people dying in the wilderness, there will be grave after grave, people will die, be buried, others will die and be buried, and Moses will be there to witness all these things. It is a constant reminder of the consequences of sin. The wages of sin is death. All of us here, we may have experienced certain circumstances in life, but as we go through our lives, there will be victories. There will also be failures. There will be times of rejoicing, times of sadness. Like Moses, we experience all these things. Interestingly, Moses broke out into a prayer. And here, we learned how he asked the Lord to teach him to number the days. This is what we want to learn. So the first thing we want to learn is to understand about life. Look at verse 10. The days of our years are three score years and ten. And if by reason of strength they be four score years, yet is their strength, labor, and sorrow, for it is soon cut off, and we fly away. Now this statement speaks of the length of life which a man will live because of sin. One score means 20 years, three score and ten means 70 years. And if by reason of strength means 80 years, if we have been blessed with good health and strength. That does not mean that no one will live beyond 80 years. There are some who may live up to 90, 100 years, but generally speaking, 80. That will be our bonus years. It is not the norm. In fact, those people will live beyond 90, 100. They are isolated cases. 80. 70 for most people, by way of strength. 80 years. Moses wrote this almost 3,400 years ago. Think about this. With all the science and advancement we have today, men boast about technology, yet we cannot add on to the span of our lives. We cannot go beyond this figure. 70 and at most 80. If a man live up to 80 years old, his life will be filled with trouble and sorrow. He would have to label with great infirmities. He would have to experience much pain and sorrow. Every month we will visit the Monash Gardens elderly home. I've never experienced one elderly resident come to me and say, you know dear pastor, I have been feeling so good. Each day of my life I'm just getting better and better. No sickness, no pain, no sorrow. Every time we have the worship service at the end, I'll ask them, are there any prayer items? They will tell me, pray for my legs, pray for my shoulders, pray for my neck, you name it. There will always be pain, there will always be troubles, there will always be infirmities. Our physical bodies are created and conditioned in such a way that 
when we experience pain, we experience all these troubles that afflicts our body. It is a warning sign that we are closer to the end. The death may knock on our doors. In his God's way, the Creator's way of telling us that your days may soon come to an end. The Bible tells us, for it is soon cut off. Our days, our years on this earth, whether by sickness or by accident or by any adverse circumstances of life may come to an end, all of a sudden it is cut off. Just like the grass in the fields would be cut off. You know, when I was driving to Phillip Island together with Dr. Jeffrey Koo, he shared with me about the passing away of Jemima. You know how from a persistent cough led to this checkup that there was a lung, lung and then they went for chemotherapies, radiotherapies. The lung actually grew smaller, thought that everything was okay. But then when the therapy stopped, it just fled up. And then a life was cut off. That is our life. It will soon be cut off. Only God knows when. We do not know when. And the Bible tells us also, Moses said, And we fly away like a shadow. You see it here, and soon it just disappears. Or the bird that spreads the wind or winds bend and then just fly it away. Now you see the bird and then the next moment it just flies away. That is our lives. One moment we are breathing, the next moment we are dead. One moment we are alive, next moment we are in the grave. That is why James says, for what is your life? It is just like a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanishes away. James 4 verse 14. So whether 70, 80, soon our lives will come to an end and death, when it knocks, everything stops. That is why in life you have unfinished songs, unfinished symphonies, unfinished paintings people have to stop all that and then life is cut off and they just fly away as in you see them now the next moment they are gone then Moses went on to say who knoweth the power of thine anger even according to thy fear, so is thy wrath. Indeed, God is angry with sin. How can he not be? Moses knew that. If you remember Moses, he experienced how God was angry with the Israelites who created and worshipped the golden calf. He was aware of how God was angry when they murmured against him instead of giving thanks to God for bringing them out of the oppression of the Egyptians they murmured we are better off in Egypt and then how Aaron and Miriam also criticize the leader whom God has chosen Moses himself Instead of speaking to the rock, he struck the rock. God was angry. <coughs> Who knoweth the power of his anger? The believers. The believers who fear God. Knows that because of our sins. 
God sent His only begotten Son, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, into this world to die for wretched sinners like you and me. The believers knows that. The believers who fears God knows that our Lord Jesus took upon Himself the wrath of God, which otherwise you and I, even for all eternity, we cannot bear this wrath of God. Even if we were to die a million and a million times, we still cannot bear the wrath of God. Jesus bore it on the cross. Who doesn't know? The unbelievers, the unbelieving world, do not know, and they will laugh at God. In fact, they will challenge, they will question, why would a loving God send people to eternal hell? Why would a loving God be angry with sin, right? You would have experienced your unbelieving friends asking you all these questions. The question is not why would. Why wouldn't God? Think about this. Why wouldn't God be angry with the sins of this world? Look at the wickedness the evil, look at the violence in this world, look at the immoralities, look at the worldliness in this world. A few days ago, I was driving to church and I switched on the radio and there was this so-called worship service. And this worship service was conducted by a church known as the Garden of Eden. Apparently, all the members are naked when they worship God. And the members, they commit sexual sins with one another. Parents, grandparents, children. So it was talked about, discussed, in the internet or in the on the radio i was listening and the pastor of the church said well we are returning to the garden of eden can you imagine such horrendous sins we are living in perilous times as dr jeffrey Koo yesterday talked about the apostasies the compromises the people who attack God's word, the people who twist God's word, we are living in such times. The unbelieving world will not understand because they do not know God. They do not fear Him. They do not want to face this reality of one day standing before this Almighty God in the horror of their sins. They try to ignore all these things. Only the believers who fear God know the wrath of God. Know the power of sins and knowing what sin had done, sin brought our Lord Jesus Christ into this world where He died on the cross, He shed His precious blood. So as believers we know, what should we do? How should we respond? Understanding our lives 70 years, at most 80. How should we live our lives? Well, Moses said, look at verse 12. So teach us to number our days, that we may ap apply our hearts unto wisdom. The psalmist says, so teach us, as if this is something that is slipping out of his mind. People tend to forget. As humans, we always forget. I believe when I said at the beginning of this message, based on this passage, that our days on this earth are about three score and ten, and by reason of strength, four score. Most of you will say, yeah, I heard about that 70 years, at most 80 years. If I've been blessed with good health and strength, I know that. 
But we live our lives not applying this truth. We live our days on this earth forgetting the fact that it is only 70 years and most 80 years. We plan for our retirements. <coughs> we look forward to spending our days as if we will just go on and on and on, right? Moses says, teach us as if this is something that was slipping away out of his mind. Teach us that we may number our days. Interestingly, the Bible did not say number our months, years, or even weeks, but days. That tells us just how short our days are on this earth. If you are 75 years old, let's say you live up to 80 years old, you have only another five years, right? You know how long is five years? It is only 1,825 days. That's all you have on this earth. 1,825 days. Yesterday we arrived here. Today is the second day. You blink your eyes. This will be the end of the camp. I'll be sending Dr. Ku back to the airport. You will say goodbye. The next time we meet could be one, two, three, five years later. 1,825 years. That's all. If, God willing, you have five years, what if you have only one? 365 days. The Bible says, number our days, which means keep a careful watch over our time. Our time is limited. 70, 80 years, limited. Yesterday I had a good conversation with a visitor in our church. It's a friend of David, and we were talking about the inflation, high costs of living today, high mortgages, and he was telling me that our income is limited. So we have to be very careful in the things we spend our money. So what is important, what is of priority, we have to spend our money on those things, right? <coughs> the same principle, the same discipline we should apply not to our money, but to our time. Our time is limited. If we know that we have limited time, then some activities will deserve more time. Other activities may deserve less time or even no time at all. We have to be very careful, right? Because we have limited time. 70 years, if not 80. That's the most we have. The word number means to weigh out or to count. In other words, we must make each day of our lives count for God. Every day, we consider, I hope at the end of the day, when we, before you go to bed, you just think, can I count this day worthy for my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? By way of illustration, <laughs> if you are an employee and you work for someone, but you go to work, you just lay around, chit chat with your friends and then serve the internet and not doing serious work. Can your one day be counted worthy of your employer? No, most certainly not. It's not worthy. You should not be paid, right? God has given to us 70 or 80 years. We want to make 
each day count for our Almighty God. I pray that all of us will take it, consider. We are not just facing an employer, we are facing the Almighty God. When we stand before Him, we want to hear Him say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of the Lord. So, in order to do that, we want to make sure each day count for our God. What are the things we are doing? Do they relate to God? Do they have anything to do with the glory of God? We have to consider. So let me suggest to you, make your day's number for God by worshipping Him. Worshipping Him with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. As one theologian said, as if this is your last hour on this earth. So when you listen to the message, you listen to the message as if it is your last message. When you sing the hymn, you sing the hymn as if that is your last hymn you're going to sing on this earth. When you give all your tithes and your offerings, you give as if this will be the last of my offering I'm going to give to God. This is my last hour. When you and I have this kind of attitude, this kind of worshipful attitude, then we can make our days be numbered for God. And then also, be prayerful. If God is in control of all things, not you and I, He taught us in the Bible that we ought to redeem the time. The Bible did not say redeem a time or redeem some time, at times, or any time. But the time, there is a definite time. No more, no less, given by God Himself. So we want to make the best of all the opportunities God has given to us, live our lives to glorify Him. We have to pray, be prayerful. God, give me the strength that I will live my life to glorify You. And how do we know how to live our lives? Read God's Word. Maybe the more we read God's word, the more we understand His command, His promises, His will for us, and then you and I will live our lives to glorify Him. Right? So worship God, be prayerful, read the Bible, and serve Him. Serve Him all the days of your life. I pray that all of us here will remember this. We do not live forever. We only have 70, at most, 80 years, if by way, by reason of strength and good health. And we live these 70 or 80 years to glorify Him. Make each day of these 70 or 80 years to number for God. At the end of the day, we retire to bed, we ask ourselves, is this day worthy to be numbered for God? If not, Lord, forgive me. Tomorrow, I will make tomorrow number for thee. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank thee for enabling us to consider this passage. Oh Lord, help us to learn from thy precious word. Teach us to number our days. Indeed, we do not look at our lives as in terms of years, or even months, or even weeks, but in days. That tells us how short our lives on this earth are. Help us to live with this spiritual perspective. Help us to make each day of our lives, number for thee, count for thee, that we may glorify thee, as thou hast taught us, even through the Westminster, Shorter Catechism, the chief end of men, is to glorify thee, and to enjoy thee forever. 
So teach us and help us. Remind us all this. This we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen.